Welcome everybody uh, to today's event on expertise and objectivity in science and politics. I'm Tony Mills, a senior fellow here at the American Enterprise Institute, and I will be your host and moderator for today's event. I'm uh, delighted to be joined by a terrific uh, panel of colleagues and friends to help us think through these topics. And uh, I'd like to begin by introducing our panelists. Uh, first, we have Taylor Dotson, who is an associate professor of social pol uh, social science, excuse me, at the New Me Mexico Institute of Mining and Technology. He's also the author of the recent and timely book, The Divide, How Fanatical Certitude is Destroying Democracy. Uh, next, we have Ari Schulman, who is the editor of The New Atlantis, a quarterly journal uh, of science and technology, uh, to which I'm uh, myself quite partial, but also I think it's uh, a place that has become a value, invaluable uh, uh, venue for, for thoughtful reflection on the kinds of questions we'll be talking about today, especially uh, during the pandemic. Um, and last but not least, we have uh, my colleague, uh, Phil Wallach, uh, who is a fellow, senior fellow here at the American Enterprise Institute, uh, where he studies Congress, the administrative state, uh, and the separation of powers. Uh, and he's <clears throat> lately produced a number of uh, very insightful articles and papers um, looking at um, the coronavirus crisis in the context of his research on, on our federal institutions. And so um, thank you all for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you. Um, I'd like to begin uh, before hand handing it over to our panelists um, to just give a brief overview of, of what I'm hoping that we can accomplish today and how the conversation will, will go. Uh, and then say a few words about the topic. Um, so to begin, um, I'll offer a few introductory remarks uh, and then pass it over to our panelists to offer theirs. Um, after that, um, we'll have a, a discussion um, about the issues that, that are raised um, for 25 minutes or so. Um, toward the end of our discussion, I will uh, open things up for uh, audience Q&A. Um, so please feel free at that point to submit your questions um, and you'll see on the bottom of your screen right now, you can do that by emailing them uh, directly to Ian Banks uh, or uh, tweeting to Ian uh, and he will uh, uh, feed the questions to us and, and I'll, uh, I'll try my best to integrate them into the remain remainder of our discussion. Um, so today's topic is on the one hand, a rather esoteric philosophical one, uh, the nature of scientific expertise and its relationship to uh, political governance. Um, on the other hand, it's one that we've all uh, become intimately familiar with, especially during the course of the pandemic. Uh, it's something that we've all had to grapple with. Um, and it, one of the, the phrases that has uh, sort of echoed in all of our ears throughout the course of it is, th is this phrase, uh, follow the science, which I see as a kind of a rhetoric uh, for understanding the relationship between science and politics that implies a fairly substantive, if not always explicitly articulated account of what scientific expertise is and how it relates to political decision making. And I think to those who you know, uh, use this phrase, um, it, it promises um, a way of uh, rationalizing our political uh, decision making so that we can formulate policies on a firm objective foundation, scientific base of evidence, um, that will minimize conflict and disagreement in the political sphere. But of course, perhaps uh, ironically, as we all know, that is not uh, a good characterization of how the pandemic has played out. We're as polarized now as, we, as, as we've ever been. Um, and that polarization and disagreement and conflict has implicated just about every aspect of our pandemic policies. And so one might look at that and say, uh, the problem is that we're not following the science. Um, Another way to look at this situation is to say, perhaps our, our rhetoric and our thinking about science and its relationship to politics is what's to blame here. And maybe we need to rethink um, both the nature of the kind of scientific expertise that we need uh, and how it relates to political decision-making. And so to stimulate the discussion, I just wanna make two suggestions. And one is that um, this follow the science rhetoric uh, is problematic uh, both by uh, mischaracterizing the nature of scientific expertise, specifically the kind of expertise that is that we need to uh, call on to make difficult choices during a crisis like the pandemic. In particular, 
uh, it, it ignores or papers over the fact that often we're drawing on lots of different kinds of scientific and medical expertise, um, different domains and disciplines that have sometimes different, sometimes even conflicting methodologies and standards of evidence. Um, and that this does not issue in a neutral body of um, certain evidence that we can simply take up and apply in the policy realm, um, but rather a complex set of expert judgments about a whole host of uh, complicated uh, issues. And th this points to a second way in which this rhetoric has, has failed us. And that is uh, by, by implying that our political decision-making itself can be uh, uh, rationalized in some way, can be rendered apolitical in the sense of um, being constrained by uh, an objective uh, evidence base that would eliminate the need for value judgments, um, making trade-offs, um, weighing a whole set of considerations and goals. Uh, so I don't hope we can get into some of this in the course of our discussion. I, uh, I, I put that out there now as just a way to, um, as I say, stimulate discussion and, and frame some of what we'll, what we'll be uh, hearing from our panelists. So without further ado, I'd like to pass this uh, over to Taylor, uh, and uh, I will uh, look forward to hearing uh, his insights. Thanks, Tony, and thanks for the invite, and thanks to all of you for attending. I'm, I'm delighted to be here and contribute to this conversation on a very important issue. Uh, with, with my opening remarks, um, I'm going to focus on this question of what makes why, why is follow the science so problematic for issues like COVID? What makes COVID different from other political problems? Um, so to start with, I'll, I'll remind you all of a distinction Raji Pil Roger Pilkey Jr. makes in his book called The Honest Broker between two different styles of political problems, tornado politics and abortion politics. So when there's a tornado bearing down on a town, um, you usually don't sit down to liberate. You know, it's pretty pretty straightforward to get people to so, quote, unquote, follow the science or listen to authorities. Few people respond to an alarm with questions about the adequacy of weather science. Um, abortion, on the other hand, um, it's a case where politics is only, only muddied, muddled or made worse by trying to insert science. Because we all know that most of us had a strong opinion about abortion long before we took high school biology, right? We all know that it's a, it's a matter of people's values and beliefs, not, not what they know. COVID is neither of these. It's not tornado politics and it's not abortion politics as much as some people want it to be one or the other. It's what I call radiation politics. It's a similar prob political problem as nuclear energy. There's potentially catastrophic risks, but it, these risks aren't something that are knowable through common sense. They're nearly invisible. They're hard to gauge. They happen at, at very large scales. And they're often as much long acting as immediate. So as a result, we are inexorably relying on experts to understand the nature and extent of the problems and challenges we face with it, and even to be able to weigh different solutions. A consequence of this utter dependence is that it demands an amount, immense amount of trust, right? Because it's not something that we can sort of grasp through common sense, we have to believe that you know officials and experts are not taking us for a ride. And so what sank the nuclear industry in the mid 20th century was not the technology per se, though that was a part of it, but that experts in charge of assuring the safety of the American people from radiation risks became seen as untrustworthy. And the unfortunate thing is when I've been watching this whole pandemic unfold, I've been seeing public health officials for the most part repeating these mistakes, not recognizing that they're in this moment of radiation politics. What One other thing, there's two so, sort of areas that make radiation politics particularly contentious. Um, the first is that the impacts and consequences of both the problem and the solutions to it are just are far broader than say health and safety, energy costs or tons of carbon because COVID isn't a twister bearing down on us. Um, it's something that unfolds over the, we've been experiencing it over the course of years, um, people's concerns beyond life and limb can't be so easily discounted. Uh, that's just sort of obvious, but it's, it's very, very important. Um, people care just as deeply about their social lives and mental health, their livelihoods as their disease risk. But for cases like COVID, there's this tendency to reduce the problem to just the facets that science deals with, just the stuff that's most easily quantified, deaths, case numbers, ICU beds, and to sort of push all the other stuff off to the side. But the problem is, is that trust in, in public officials and experts very quickly dissipates when these less easily measured concerns get pushed, pushed to the side. This isn't unexpected. It's just, this is, follows a pattern that we've recognized for decades. Populism is literally the rejection of elites as out of touch or uncaring 
about the concerns of ordinary citizens. So follow the science rhetoric that downplays the mental health of school children sequestered at home or forced to eat lunch outside by themselves at recess or businesses being shuttered. This unnecessarily sows resentment. The second failing is that experts in these moments tend to exaggerate their certainty, right? They think they're in a moment of tornado politics when they're not. And usually for cases of radiation politics, the science itself is beset with a lot of thorny complications. We're all familiar with the way that officials at the very beginning of the pandemic said, told the American people, don't buy masks. They don't work. They're not going to help you. And then turned around weeks later, masks became part of the mandatory protocols for most states. This, they weren't following the science here, right? They admitted later, Anthony Fauci and, and others, that their concern was this broader concern, this, that they were going to uh, run out of PPE for healthcare workers. And so they're trying to sort of... Uh, you know, uh, massage the message in order to get citizens to not hoard masks and act irresponsibly. But this mixed messaging led to greater mistrust. And unfortunately, we seem to be repeating this issue, this mixed messaging for so-called natural immunity. Scientists don't yet understand the extent of it. Um, you know, there's competing studies from the CDC and Israel and other places, but nevertheless, officials are downplaying or denying the existence of post-infection immunity. And the real concern here is that, again, that citizens will act irresponsibly, prefer the affection to the vaccine. But it's, it's, it's not hard to read between the lines here. People are recognizing and citizens recognize that officials are trying to manage their response. They're, they're shading the science to try to serve what they see as a higher purpose. And however noble that higher purpose is, it ends up as a, as a consequence helping vindicate the belief that follow the science is just a ploy to get contentious policies put in place. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. I can talk more concretely at what I think would be um, how we could do better, what would be solutions. But the gist is really to do the opposite of what we've been doing. Um, be upfront and honest about uncertainties that we're still feeling our way through a lot of the science on this and that decisions have to be made without having all the facts. Uh, on officials and scientists should be upfront that they have these extra scientific motivations and values concerns, whether it's about protecting equipment for healthcare workers or uh, making sure people do make sort of the best decisions possible for preventing spread of COVID. But in order for all this to work, I, there's gonna have to be some public input or, and self-governance because of these broader concerns at stake. And if we're gonna avoid populist resentment and backlash and actually do good policy, I can't see any other way than proceeding democratically. I'll leave it at that. Um, thanks and I look forward to your questions. Thanks Taylor, uh, raises a number of uh, really uh, important, interesting uh, questions, which I hope we can get to. Uh, in the meantime, I'd like to pass it over to Phil Wallach. Thanks, Tony, and uh, thanks to everyone for joining us today. Uh, I want to, before I get to science, step back and address a more basic question, which is just where does trust come from at all for anything? So what makes us accept the need to give responsibility for important matters affecting our lives to other people. Well, necessity is obviously the root of it. Um, we, we can't do everything for ourselves, especially in the, the complicated technological lives that we lead. Um, we might wish that we could just repeatedly observe somebody doing something well in a way that we feel capable of judging and trust them, therefore, based on direct personal experience. But that kind of trusting is is really very limited in our lives. Most of the time, we're having to proceed on the basis of, of something much less direct than that. Um, so what kind of qualities do we look for when, when, when we think about whether to trust people? So first is reputation. And this is a, admittedly going to be a little hand wavy because in real life, reputation is a little bit um, amorphous and, and just out there. We trust people because they're known to be trustworthy and trusted by others. That seems pretty circular, but that's life. Um, that is, in fact, why, why we put our trust in most people is because we see others like us who we think are trustworthy making the same decisions to put their trust in them. Um, you know, in the COVID era, I've never even been inside my my daughter's preschool to to be able to directly observe her her teachers teaching her. Uh, but they seem like okay folks who other parents 
entrusted their children with before me. And so uh, there we go. Um, it is worth saying that when trust is based on that kind of reputation, it can be very fragile. Reputation can be fragile. If we lose faith in other people's judgments or come to think that a whole group of our uh, fellow citizens is, is basing their decisions to trust on incorrect factors, it can all fall apart rather quickly. So what else other than just vague reputation? Well, we have qualifications and credentials. We hear a lot about the meritocracy and thinking about getting people basically certified as worthy. Um, that could mean just because they went to fancy schools showing how smart they are. Uh, that could because they passed certain tests that showed that they mastered certain bodies of knowledge um, that therefore make them qualified to do something. Um, there's a different kind of reason to trust somebody, which I would call representativeness. Um, we trust them not because of special qualities, but because of the ways they're like us. Uh, we trust them because we think that our interests are overlapping and intertwined with their own, and therefore when they act in their own interest, it will also work out for us. That's really going to be very important when we think about politics. Um, Finally, there's authority. We trust people because they're in charge. This would go back to Taylor's tornado politics. Sometimes you, you're looking for somebody to take charge. Somebody sort of has naturally been given that charge by official authority. They become the authority on the spot and you listen to them. Um, but that too is a little bit, um, if everyone is questioning authority all the time as seems to be the case in our society, if it becomes a badge of honor to question authority and to say, maybe the authorities are not on our side, then that becomes problematic. So the last point I'll make generally about trust is it's it really is never all purpose. We don't trust somebody, period, full stop, for all purposes. We do talk about people as being competent or incompetent, but really we ought to say people have different competences. They have a competence at X or Y, and we want to trust them for those purposes. Um, we, we really, it doesn't really ever make sense to just put your trust in somebody entirely unless you want to devote your life to, to, to following somebody, uh, sort of give yourself over to a charismatic authority, which most of us um, don't do. Uh, so, how does science fit into all that? So science is a particular, offers a particular kind of reputation. Um, I would say it, it comes from something like a community of scientists in good standing with their peers. Um, it's not just about credentials, because the truth is that on any side of a difficult question, you can find people with good credentials on both sides of the issue. And interestingly, in, in this COVID context that we're going to talk about today, um, you know, anti-vaxxers are constantly trumpeting the impressiveness of the credentials of the people on their side, and some of them are very impressive. So just appealing to credentials isn't what science is about. It's about saying that there is this community that knows how to reason in a certain way, that knows how to pursue objective truth and put aside other concerns, and that we think of as reliable and therefore wish to treat as authoritative. So in ordinary language, it seems to me that when we call a decision-making body scientific, that's come to mean that we think of it as trustworthy. And often we're not very good at delimiting what it's trustworthy for. We come to think of uh, science as something like an all-purpose competence. That's how it serves in general language often anyway. On the other side, when we say something, decision-making body is being political, we generally mean that as an insult. We generally mean that it's not thinking clearly, it shouldn't be trusted, it's pursuing some agenda, as if that's necessarily a disqualifying thing to be pursuing an agenda. Um, but I think we need to think hard about why politics can sometimes be the thing that we wanna put our trust in instead of science. 
political trustworthiness is based on representativeness and it has the potential to make people trustworthy for different kinds of decisions. And what we need to realize is one of those kinds of decisions is the ever difficult question of when and how we ought to be putting our trust in subject specific experts, because there is no other way to adjudicate those difficult questions other than through some kind of general political debate um, and thinking through things and deciding them on the basis of politics and representativeness. There is no science to, to sort out the scientists. Uh, you know, Aristotle, I believe, said that politics w w was sort of the master science that's meant to help us uh, govern the organization of the others. So um, I'll leave you with a slogan. Experts should be on tap, not on top. I like to repeat that a lot. It's sometimes attributed to Harry Truman, and it seems to be the essence of the matter. We, we need to be able to trust experts in their domains, but we should not uh, confuse ourselves and think that their domains encompass all of political life. Thanks, Phil. Um, there's a lot, lot there to chew on. Um, in the meantime, I'd like to pass it over to Ari. Uh, thanks, Tony. Thank you very much for uh, for organizing this and uh, including me in this. Um, so there's a there's a million places that you can start with a subject like this, and there's a lot of ground to cover. And one of the things that I found in writing and speaking about this for many years now, and especially during COVID, is uh, everybody's at a different place in thinking about this issue. And whenever you're talking about this, you're going to be talking about one particular thing, and people are going to often hear a kind of dog whistle maybe for a particular point of view that they're worried about. Uh, and one of the most difficult things to do here is to be able to talk about uh, what has gone wrong and the idea that something has gone wrong with the political relationship with expertise without seeming to be giving um, aid and comfort to people who just want to, uh, you know, want to stick it to Fauci or something like that. Um, so I think one of the first things you have to think about when approaching this subject is to just recognize, be willing to recognize that something has gone amiss and that we are, we may have to get into uncharted waters a little bit uh, in thinking about how to address these problems, uh, but that there are also a lot of things that we can draw on, examples from everyday life and from American history and from political life that give us some sense of direction there. Um, so with all that, with that throat clearing out of the way, um, having read and written about this for a long time, what I find is that w once people recognize that there is something off about the follow the science slogan and the way that it uh, shows up in political life. The first temptation is usually to, to talk about science as a realm of facts and politics as a realm of values and to try to uh, assert a boundary between those things and to say, we need experts to just tell it like it is. We need them to just uh, give us the facts, stop giving us their opinions and leave that to politicians to decide. Um, that way of thinking about things I think would be a dramatic improvement over where we are but I think that it is, it is its own way of distorting what's at stake. And it's, it's valuable for people to try to get past that. Um, one of the ways to summarize this is to think about the idea that science is not just about discovering the truth, right? When we talk about follow the science, we have this almost image of science as like Moses coming down from the mountain uh, with the tablets, right? It is simply a conduit for opening a window that reveals what the world looks like. And that is true to an extent, um, but when science verges on the political realm, is usually dealing with questions that are not amenable to being answered in that way. And so instead of just thinking about science as a way of discovering the truth, it's useful to think about it as a way of doing things, of trying to achieve results in the world. Uh, it involves uh, character aspects like experience and judgment. It involves thinking about strategies for how to achieve things. Um, in other words, science as, it, uh, as we need to draw on it in politics properly involves uh, value considerations. Um, th something, this is something Tony has written about, Dan Sarowitz has written about this. There isn't a simple unitary view of science. Science is composed of many disciplines and each of those disciplines will have its own view on how to approach a problem. Even during the pandemic, you have a different view coming from uh, epidemiologists who look at entire population trends related to the outbreak versus clinicians who are looking at the kind of standards of evidence that you want for treating patients in hospitals. Even within the health community, there are different disciplinary outlooks. Uh, 
And those are not about some kind of, uh, those don't arise from some relativistic view of what science is. They arise from the fact that our world is uh, multifaceted. There are lots of different things that we could consider and each of these disciplines has a different sort of focus. Um, and I think it's useful to think about politics harnessing that kind of pluralism um, and that difference of viewpoints. Uh, there are everyday examples that we can call upon uh, to think about this. I've talked a lot lately about um, the example of going to a car mechanic or picking out an architect who's going to build your home. Um, that Choosing an expert who can do one of those things, there are some very clear boundaries on that that are set, I would say, not by science, but just by reality and physics. Uh, if your house falls down, you probably picked the wrong home builder. Uh, if your car mechanic wants you to spend $20,000 to fix your 1995 Miata, that's probably a bad car mechanic. There are some standards there that everybody can agree upon, and those are set somewhat by external reality. But within that, there can be a wide variety of views about how to achieve something and even about what it is the thing that you want to achieve. And the expert there can be valuable not simply for telling you how to achieve a value that you already have, but for alerting you to, to considerations that you might not have been aware of. There's a kind of push and pull there that we recognize when we're harnessing experts in these uh, ordinary everyday situations that we somehow aren't able to recognize in the political realm where the difficulty and the complexity of the problems is vastly greater uh, than when we're doing something like trying to get our car fixed and where we therefore should need an even uh, greater amount of push and pull there. Um, but the point is that I, I think for a lot of critics of the follow the science point of view, the natural inclination is to try to get values out of science, get values out of the role of the expert. And I think we need to be doing that somewhat. But I think that the, the problem that we're dealing with is the recognition that those values are always going to be there anyway. Uh, and we need to be thinking about how to have institutional structures, rhetorical structures, political structures that recognize that experts, um, like all other leaders have a kind of power that kind of power is something we need as a society that power is very useful to us that power also comes with dangers it can distort people's uh minds it can distort their souls power can corrupt and we need to have structures that can harness that kind of ability while not expecting uh there to be uh, not expecting angel uh, experts to be angels um, so the, the basic model that I try to suggest to people is we right now have this idea of there's a single view of science. Any old spokesman basically will do as long as they're honest. And then the experts should just follow whatever they say. And it needs to be the other way around. It needs to be um, politicians making the ultimate decisions, but also recognizing that the experts come loaded with a kind of point of view. They are biased in a way that is actually useful. And you, you want them to be biased in a certain way. Uh, a certain way. And you also want to be drawing on multiple of them. You want a leader who's going into a room and soliciting multiple views from the best minds in, in their respective fields, and then making his or her own decision about what needs to happen. Um, turn it back to you, Tony. Thanks, Harry. Um, yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of great stuff there. And I hope we can, we can come back to that. Um, one thing I just want to mention, uh, maybe we can come back to is thinking about that model you outlined at the end there and com comparing and contrasting that with what has in fact happened with uh, COVID response. I'm thinking especially about Phil, who's written recently about the uh, the, uh, the task force um, that was assembled to, to deal with the COVID crisis and during the Trump administration. But anyway, bef before getting into that, um, I wanted to sort of step back and, uh, and just make an observation, which is that I think one of the challenges in having a fruitful discussion about this topic is um, unlearning certain habits about thinking about some of these issues, but particularly about the nature of science. I think we all sort of, um, whatever our exposure to science is, we, we've probably at some point uh, inherited or come into contact with a kind of folk view about science, um, which doesn't leave room or a lot of room for judgment. Um, science is, is thought about as a kind of machine that produces outputs whether it's you know, technological outputs or, or knowledge outputs, um, rather than the way Phil was describing it as a kind of body of expertise composed of a um, uh, community of, of, of inquirers who have different um, skills and viewpoints and so on. Um, 
So I think one thing that might be helpful is just to step back and, and, and recognize that judgment plays an important role in science. And that particularly in the kinds of sciences that we're calling on uh, during something like a pandemic, I think for, for instance, of public health, which is a field that is kind of a hybrid of science and public policy, where what public health experts are concerned with is not simply discovering the truth, as Ari put it, but also um, having good public health outcomes, which requires um, people to behave in a certain way, to adopt certain uh, policies or behavioral uh, uh, patterns or to adhere to certain inter uh, interventions or rules. Uh, so there's no way uh, to disentangle um, judgment and value judgments from that kind of expertise. Um, and I think if we if we approach it from that point of view, we wind up with a um, with a different understanding of the relationship between the scientific expert and, and the political actor. Uh, I, I'd like to sort of get into some some concrete examples a little bit. And um, you know, what, one way to do that, I think, um, is, is thinking about um, where judgment comes into play. So I think judgment comes into play in science and in, in, in practical life when there's uncertainty. Um, and uncertainty, of course, is, is an important part of science, the scientific uh, process. Um, and I know, Taylor, that certainty is something that you've written a lot about, um, uh, the role and the sort of dangers of a certain kind of fanatical certitude in politics. I'd like to hear you talk a little bit about that, but specifically the, in terms of the, 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 the pandemic, um, what, what the nature of uncertainty that we're talking about. So not all uncertainty is the same, right? So in the scientific field, we might have a certain amount of well uh, quantified uncertainty about a conclusion. Um, you know, some scientific facts are probabilistic in nature. Um, there's also uncertainty that can come into play when we don't know what we don't know. There could be uh, hidden variables. There could be um, confounding effects in an experiment that we don't know how to control for. Um, you know, so I think about, for instance, you know, a case like vaccines where we have a very well established um, uh, understanding of how vaccines work, set of protocols for evaluating safety and efficacy. Um, and there's, you know, there may be uncertainties here and there, and these could be important, but there isn't, you know, wide ranging crippling uncertainty in the scientific community about whether we should be vaccinated. You know, that's a case where it seems like certainty is not really our, uh, you know, uncertainty is not really our problem per se, versus a policy intervention like masks, uh, where uh, the state of the science at the beginning of the pandemic was in a very different place than, say, the science of vaccines. Um, so I guess what I want to ask you is, uh, how do we have a responsible conversation in the public sphere about these kinds of uncertainty um, and what role they should play in our decision making. Because I think one of the challenges is that it requires uh, to really grapple with these notions of uncertainty it does require a certain either fluency with the relevant kinds of exp expertise or dependence on the experts to characterize that, expert, that uh, uncertainty for us. Um, and this, I think this is a major challenge, and I think it's it's, it's stymied a lot of our, our efforts during the pandemic. So I, I wondered if you could if you could speak to that, especially given your um, your reflections on the role of certainty in politics. Yeah, sure. There's there's a lot there, and and you 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 sort of already spelled out a lot of the a lot of the issues and, and comments by Phil and, and others got there. That yeah, I mean there's these there's the you know the you know the p value that they might put on a study that's sort of the quantified certainty and how you know that statistical power for a study. But even then, there's there's differences between how different disciplines will look at it, different kinds of study designs. I, I mentioned that um, the competing studies on natural immunity between what's the CDC reported saying vaccines are five times more powerful and the Israeli study that said natural immunity is 27 times more powerful, but they measured completely different things. One was looking at, um, you know, just saying people that come to the hospital um, are, you know, are they testing positive for COVID? who's vaccinated, who's not. And the Israeli study followed a cohort for several months. So they're completely different types of experiments that actually don't even measure the same thing. And I think some of the issue runs in is, is that at least within um, the media, there's this tendency to want to give factual clarity um, when it, it doesn't exist, right? That these are these are sort of apples and oranges comparisons and that you know the, the information that we really need to know is, is probably gonna come too late. And then the other issue is that, you know, for a lot of things, as things leave the laboratory, as they leave the study, it, it just becomes vastly more complicated. I mean, I, I mean, I, 
I'm maybe a little bit guilty of this myself, but when the vaccines were first coming out, there was sort of this sentiment that, oh, good, we've we're, we're, we've we fixed COVID. This is this is all going away because we've studied this vaccine. We know it works um, and whatever else. And then and then yeah, then variants happen, and, and there's a lot of question marks happening about whether or not you know a herd immunity through vaccination is even possible. It seems like there's signs of endemic COVID. So that's an area where that actually you know surprised at least some of the scientists. But even with that, there's the uncertainties that come with, does it work, right? I think um, a lot of people thought in their mind, you know, vaccines were this ultimate techno fix, that it'll bring it in, it cuts through all the contention, it cuts through all the disagreement and just gives us a, a solution. But the complications that arose had to do with distribution, it had to do with acceptance. There, there's a whole lot of areas that people weren't really thinking that actually, no, that the vaccine was, the, developing the vaccine was the easy part. Doing the politics and the logistics and everything else to do with the vaccine, that's what we needed to be studying um, before we even launched it and figuring out, um, you know, what we can do, much less to get into masks and ventilation and, and all the other things that surprised us. So I, I want to come back to some of these, Tyler, and especially thinking about what kind of what an alternative looks like, what, what you know, what what a response to a crisis like the pandemic might have looked like had we been thinking about some of those questions. Uh, before doing that, I want to I want to um, uh, come back to you, Phil. Um, so you've written recently about um, you've looked carefully at how the Trump administration, in particular, uh, responded to the pandemic, especially kind of in the early phase. Um, and you know, there's a lot to, that's exasperating <laughs> there. And I, I'd be curious to hear from you what you see as some of the primary um, locuses of uh, uh, the, the, the places where we we, we did um, we handled the situation um, most problematically, and what role the the certain view of following the science um, played in stymieing our our efforts. Especially, I'm thinking of you know first year of the pandemic. Thanks. Um, so yeah, I wrote a. Uh... A book review of a very good book by two reporters. It's called um, Nightmare Scenario by uh, Yasmin Abutaleb and Damien Paletta, um, which, which co closely covers what went on in, in the Trump COVID task force, um, which was meant to be sort of the primary decision making body uh, during much of 2020, but, but sort of <laughs> had a lot of trouble making decisions. Um, and had this fundamental tension between the public health officials who were part of that task force and the sort of more political actors that was really never resolved uh, or, or even worked through in any productive way. It just sort of um, paralyzed them in many cases. Um, and I think the certainty question that you, you've all talked about is really at the heart of it um, it seems that one of the problems that is that the political actors want the scientific representatives to deliver them something with certainty that then they can decide what to do with. And I think the, the scientific actors feel a great pressure to conform to that lest they miss their opportunity to be heard and affect policy at all. So, you know, one of the distressing things was sort of that this book describes is how Trump was actually sold on this 15 days to slow the spread it, back, you know, at that when we were all getting hit like a uh, hit by the pandemic, like a ton of bricks in March, 2020. And the president chose to follow the public health uh, officials in saying that we need to shut everything down to get a handle on this. Um, and what, what becomes clear is that he, he thought they were telling him, if we do this, that will be that will be the end of it. We will get this under control. It will be on its way uh, to being gone in America. And they didn't really probably think that themselves uh, if they had thought reasonably about the course that uh, a virus like like uh, COVID would be likely to take, e even with very strict lockdowns that maybe America wasn't even going to be capable of. Um, 
but they pretty much got him to buy into this idea on the basis of a, a sort of certain seeming pronouncement. And understandably, he was then very disillusioned with them when that turned out to be nothing like what happened. Um, and at some point, he just sort of decided to chuck them overboard entirely and began to regard them as his adversaries. And that led to a lot of really unfortunate dynamics um, during 2020, um, where you know we saw lots of questions like masking, where a complicated truth uh, ended up getting transmuted into sort of a partisan litmus test because that's what really American politics is very good at turning almost anything into a partisan litmus test these days. Um, and, uh, you know, my, my argument lately, I, I just put out a paper about Congress and, and COVID. And my argument is, is that elected officials, for all that they've had frustrations and very understandable frustrations with the way that public health officials have conducted themselves, they haven't really done a great job thinking about, well, what are the practical compromises we can make to do reforms of these agencies? We're frustrated with the way that these agencies go about their business. We think it's wrong, especially in the context of, of a pandemic emergency. But at the end of the day, we act like deferring to them is still pretty much the only reasonable decision we can make. Um, and, and we've left, we, we, we've sort of recognized a bunch of institutional failures and then not shown any inclination to, 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 to make institutional reforms. Um, so I, I think, you know, people have gotten pretty dug in to sort of, I'm pro-science, therefore I must defend all the scientific agencies from, from the, the uh, barbarians at the gate on the one hand, or on the other hand, we can't trust public health experts at all. They're all looking to control our lives in every way. I, I mean, and once you get dug into those trenches, it's hard to make much progress. But if we would actually let ourselves talk about specifics, there's a, little, a lot more productive compromise. I'll just leave it with one example, which is the way schools are operating, right? I mean, we, we often during the past couple of years have acted as if there was some sort of binary choice. Should schools be virtual or not? And th that became a very contentious decision and different places went different ways. But, you know, all kinds of private schools who felt that they had no choice but to make something work um, all over the country came up with all kinds of things. Um, once you start thinking about practical challenges, there may be practical compromises that, that people can agree on, even if they don't agree on everything. Um, you might be able to spend a lot of money putting ventilator, not, not ventilator, ventilation systems in classrooms um, to, to help alleviate risks. You can, you, you can do any number of things uh, that don't involve merely getting dug into these uh, binary propositions. And unfortunately, we've not done the best job with that over the last couple of years. Something that... Um... You, one often hears from experts or in the media when there is a controversy around uh, give the science surrounding a given policy, whether it's masks or vaccines or uh, whatever, is that you know the reason that, that there's a controversy it stems from a misunderstanding. Um, this is really just how science operates, uh, and if only you know non-scientists, lay members of the public, would understand that. They would see that you know science is is not always certain and it progresses and so so things uh you know recommendations can change well of course on the one hand that's that's uh undeniably true where right? science does uh develop over time and even the most uh rock solid seeming uh you know, laws of physics in the history of science have turned out to in some cases be you know revised in the light of a better theory that comes along um so there's, there's you know in a certain sense, there's no there's no question that, that that's the case. On the other hand, um, in, a, in a lot of the more controversial aspects of the pandemic, um, this seems like an implausible characterization of what is really going on. I think in the case of masks, that's the best uh, example where um, one common line was that the reason why the official recommendation changed was that the science progressed. But if you look, you don't have to be a particularly 
uh, in-depth expert to look at the, the state of the, the expertise and also what other countries did vis-a-vis -vis masks to discern that uh, it's not quite that simple, that, that really we're talking about a set of judgments and trade-offs about what to do in light of the evidence that we have. So I guess the question I want to ask you, Ari, is how uh, you, you've mentioned before the way that uh, power can have an influence, uh, perhaps corrupting influence on scientific experts in the same way that it can on anybody else. How do you see uh, the uh, outsized role that scientific and medical experts have played during the pandemic as uh, shaping science itself? Um, are, you know, are we seeing uh, sort of the normal scientific process unfold in the way I was describing before, or is something else going on? Um, and what what could we what could we do about that? Uh, thanks. Uh, yeah, that's a that's a tough question because it requires uh, a level of insight into what's actually happening in science that we can only kind of get at through all of these different mediated sources that we're in the process of questioning how much we can trust them. Um, but I, I think one way you can get at it, um, the, the example of masks is an interesting and instructive one, even though I, I don't think it's by any means the most important one during the pandemic. It's just, it's instructive because it's become so fraught. Um, think of the question this way. We've been engaged in this grueling uh, fight over whether masks work or whether they don't. And you basically have two sides who are totally convinced uh, that they work very, very well, or that they work not at all. But one way you can make sense of that problem, and it's one I think everybody in this panel, we've all thought about it in this way, is simply science is pluralistic. You can find different studies that support different views, et cetera. I think another way you can think about this is uh, as a failure of thinking about science, as I said, as a, as a kind of political uh, force and of having a sort of power. Uh, we have a, a question in the chat. I don't know if I'm jumping ahead, but a uh, question from somebody asking about how leadership plays into this. Um, I, I would say the, the summary of everything that I think has gone wrong with the nature of expertise in politics is as a leadership failure. Uh, science is being called upon to serve the functions uh, that political leaders should play. And one problem, the one that I've talked about so far, is that we're not able to acknowledge that it plays that kind of role. But another problem is simply that it's being called upon to play such a prominent role at all. Um, so imagine that you're President Trump or President Biden, perhaps more plausibly, and you think it's really important, you make a decision uh, that you want the country's strategy to really involve masking. Uh, there's a few things that you would want to do there. Uh, one is that you would... Uh, you would want to have a very clear sense of the benefits and the costs of uh, pursuing that sort of strategy. One cost is simply that people don't like doing it. It's really annoying. It's grueling. It's kind of dispiriting. That's something we haven't been able to talk about. But we also been, haven't been able to talk about the fact that the benefits are just not as clear cut as we would like them to be. As a prudential judgment, uh, you know, the idea that this is a reasonably low cost thing to do um, and it might help, that's, that's a fairly sound prudential judgment. As a political uh, decision making, it's exceptionally poor leadership. So why, for example, have we not heard in all of the debates about this, have we not heard something along the lines of, uh, you know what, the research on this is a little bit mediocre. It's good enough to do it while we're developing further research, but we're really going to make it a priority to get better research on this to understand exactly how powerful of a tool this is or isn't, because whatever decision we make is going to be better backed by that. That's the kind of decision that uh, leadership could make. I think the same point applies across almost the entire COVID response about the only concerted effort we have gotten uh, of, of a clear cut example of uh, a leadership decision of we're going to make this particular thing a priority and we're going to push the scientific enterprise to deliver it is vaccination. Um, everything else is, is contrary to that. Um, I'm sorry, I know I'm going on a little bit, but I, I consider the following example, right? Imagine that it's World War II and um, you're being asked to grow your victory garden, you're being asked to ration your rubber and your steel and all of these other things. Um, and you're told that you, you need to do these things to help the effort, but you don't really have any clear idea that the United States has an army. If they do have an army, you don't know that that, ar that army is armed with weapons that work. If they are armed with weapons that work, you don't exactly know that the enemy is capable of ever uh, 
declaring defeat and agreeing to end hostilities. All of those are things that you would need leadership to be able to define for you and make decisions as to when these things are going to happen. And we haven't heard almost any of that. There was a very, very clear cut example uh, just a few days ago. Um, there was a reporter who was asking Jen Psaki, the uh, White House press secretary, about the the really anemic pace of testing, which is still at about the same rate that it was over a year ago. And the White House just came out with this plan to allow you to send in a reimbursement for your rapid test to your insurance company. And pretty, pretty small ball for two years into a once in a century pandemic. And they asked Saki about it. And she said, well, what do you want us to do? Mail a test to everybody? Well, yes, I think that would be a really good idea. Why, why is it that we don't think about that as being properly part of the kinds of question of the relationship between science and politics. Why don't we think about uh, putting, exerting political pressure? I know this is totally anathema to the way we think about science, but shouldn't it be a shared political goal for us to have much better research than we do on these really, really grueling political questions simply for the fact that they are grueling political questions? Um, so there is this kind of weird mutual agreement between where, where the way that we think about expertise hides anybody from having to have accountability for anything. Experts are, are the ones who make the decisions. We have a way of talking about it where we deny that they're the ones that make the decisions. And that's really useful for political leaders because they never have to be accountable for what they're doing. I don't know what the incentives for getting out of that is, but it seems like we have to get out of that. End of rant. Uh, thanks. So, so I just wanna, um, at this point, um, I, I know a few questions have come in already and I am uh, hope to, to get to everybody. Um, I want to encourage other viewers to feel free to submit their questions. Um, and I don't know if it's possible to put the banner back at the bottom of the screen, but the way to do that is by emailing uh, Ian Banks, uh, there, there we go, uh, or tweeting uh, directly to him. And uh, we'll, we'll try to get your, your question uh, in the mix. Um, so I, there, Ari, you touched on a question that I, I want to make sure we get back to is I think it's a very important one, which, um, uh, I think some of, I think Phil and, and Taylor will also have um, uh, insights on. Uh, before doing that, I, I want to go back to you, Taylor, for a minute. Um, so something that I, your remarks, Ari, raised in my mind was the, uh, yeah, so again, stepping back, right, and, 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 and making what I think is a fairly simple observation, but one with, with pretty important implications, which is that um, almost all the, I mean, all of the policy um, interventions that we're talking about, whether it's masks or vaccination or whatever, um, have trade-offs, right? Um, there, maybe the trade-off is really obvious, right? There's very little downside, major upside, but often have some set of trade-offs that come with them. Um, and when you talk to scientific experts, when you read, you know, uh, the peer review, uh, uh, scientific articles and so forth, um, that's usually quite obvious. I mean, that's sort of front and center in the discussion, yeah. right? So something you often hear is that, um, uh, yes, it's true that you'll hear experts say this, although maybe not as publicly as they ought to, that yes, it's true that the science of masks is not as robust as we'd like, but the downsides are so minimal uh, mm -hmm. and the upside is so great that it's it's an obviously good policy recommendation. So that's that's why, you know, as opposed to a, you know, maybe approving a, a new drug where, you know, we don't know what the side effects might be, um, if the science is not well understood, the downsides there might be greater. And so we might want to err on the side of caution. Now, what's interesting to me about that is it's, this seems very reasonable, um, but it is a value judgment uh, and it's potentially a contestable one. Um, there are there are downsides to man. I'm not, not trying to say that, you know, I mean, I, I think it's a very reasonable recommendation to say the downsides of wearing masks are, are greatly outweighed, but there are downsides. And some people are going to value those downsides more than others, right? Um, so how do we have a, um, you know, to sort of increase the legitimacy of these kinds of policy recommendations? How do we, um, what, what do we do? How do we incorporate more public input? I mean, uh, these are very technical questions. Like what's the, what is a practical way of going about doing, doing that? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a difficult question. And, um, you know, I always, cause I'm a, a big proponent of admitting uncertainty, I'm not going to claim that I have this open and shut answer for how to fix all our problems with these contentious issues in a democracy like this. Um, and, and also, I agree with um, Ari that at least better leadership could make a difference with this. Um, but I think the thing that concerns me the most is that, you know, follow the, the science and populism, they deserve each other because really it's, it's this back and forth, right? We the excesses of follow the science 
creates populist resentment. And as a result of this populist backlash and stuff, um, oftentimes the authorities and stuff sort of clamp down and, and emphasize expertise even more, which only makes the problem worse. And we're, we're wanting to try to get out of this sort of downward spiral and get to a point like what Phil was pointing at, where we can actually sit down and have deliberations about these trade-offs, right? That the proper role of scientists is not like Ari was saying to, to be the people making the decision, or at least, you know, um, sort of being the scapegoat for policymakers for why they make their decisions, but it's giving us this advice saying, these are what the trade-offs and it's, and it's up to um, officials along with the public to decide which are worth it while and which which ones are we willing to accept because that's that's really the knowledge that that ordinary citizens have they can tell you yeah man i'm not going to do that right or or i'm going to tolerate under these circumstances or i'm willing to do this for a period of time while the science improves right there can, there can be this kind of negotiation and compromise and concession which is really what democracy is all about um and, and this doesn't even have to come from political theory they 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 know from studies of how do you assure safety in a nuclear reactor or a plant that you have to take people's concerns seriously. You can't just dis dismiss them. You want you also want people to feel like they're not just a problem that's being managed. And I feel like if you asked a lot of people right now, they'd say, yeah, I feel like I'm a problem that the government's trying to manage. You want them to feel like they're part of the solution. There could be a, a bunch of different ways that, that we could do this. Um, some of the things that I think is is looks promising is in a lot of countries, they're doing what's called citizen assemblies, where they do bring um, a random selection of citizens into a sort of a venue, let them listen to scientists, and they sit there and they deliberate and they, they try to hash out all these difficult issues and make a recommendation at the end that then political officials can, you know, run with. Um, Ireland, for instance, use this to decide, uh, you know, on gay marriage and abortion. France is trying this method out to sort of get a handle on the yellow vest movement that's been, um, you know, so so contentious and active there. Um, but it doesn't have to necessarily be that. I mean, Taiwan is a great example of, of a country trying to use digital tools in order to do this. They've been using a platform called Polis in their V Taiwan system. And I think there's, there's still some work to know to see how much that system has helped with their pandemic response. Um, but they've it's, it's been great for them to sort of as a you know, emerging democracy to be able to promote online deliberation and get a sense of what are what are different groups of citizens feeling about these contentious problems before it blows up into a crisis, right? So that people can feel heard. You know, so another um, sort of go-to you might think in, in, in a kind of ven a natural venue to think about a place for weighing these kinds of trade-offs and having these deliberations would be our, our Congress, right? Our, our national legislature, which is, is supposed to be the place uh, where these kinds of things are debated. Uh, so th this is something I wanted to ask you, Phil, and it actually is closely related, I think, um, to a question that was asked um, in which Ari briefly touched on. So I just wanna read that question uh, and then um, hear, Phil, from you. So th the question is uh, whether our, our feeling compelled to either follow the science in good technocratic fashion or to reject it as good populists is a result of the demise of statesmanship and our trust in it such that we no longer presume there could be or should be leaders making overarching political judgments who sit above and, and register, but do not subordinate themselves to science or popular impulses. Instead, they sift and channel them in uh, productive directions. In short, uh, does democracy needed, uh, need statesmen if it is going to use expertise in an appropriate fashion? And so, Phil, I wanna pose that question to you and specifically hear what you, I have to say about Congress's role in this respect. Is Congress a potential uh, place where that kind of statesmanship could could fill in? Well, it ought to be, and we ought to demand that it is. And it's not the only responsible decision-making body in our country. Obviously, there were responsible officials sitting on school boards and in state legislatures and counties, all making important decisions they had a distressing tendency to act like whatever the Centers for Disease Control recommended was the only thing they could possibly do. Um, as if, well, we're, you know, we're just mere mortals and they're the scientists. Therefore, the discussion, where, we, where would we even get off having our own values and, and trying to make sense of this ourselves? Um, that's unfortunate. I, I, I guess I would, I want to 
pick a little fight with what what Taylor said about these citizen um, councils convened to sort of figure out what ordinary people think about something and and then go f as if that can settle questions. I, I, I think we have intermediating institutions that are supposed to give uh, representative officials the chance to channel what the public thinks and come to compromises accordingly. Those are legislatures. We have them. They are, you know, we, we've we've partially given up on 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 what they can do is what you know this movement that that Taylor alludes to suggests to me we've sort of don't believe that real deliberation can happen in legislature so we better give it a chance to happen somewhere else so we have e rulemaking in the united states where you know anybody can submit a comment on administrative proceedings and the agency will will dutifully sort through what, what what everyone thinks and come to some golden mean policy as a result, or so the theory goes. Um, listen, we have, we have legislatures and we need to believe that our legislature has some standing to decide questions in a way that we would, we would find uh, acceptable. We need to have the ability to have accommodations arranged by our leaders in Congress. Um, you know, and, and it turned out that what we had instead was, uh, you know, accommodations among our leaders about how to do deficit spending and send dollars around to help us live with the pandemic and all of its restrictions uh, in a less ruinous way. And we should be grateful for that. Um, you know, some people might have thought our Congress wasn't even capable of that. It, it was. It spent historic amounts of money in the last couple of years uh, and maybe has designs to spend even more. Um, but what it, we, we've kind of given up on the idea that, okay, here are these people with very different ideas about the world, but we have some practical problems and we must come to a, an accommodation. Um, so they need to go sit down and figure out something and put it in writing and let us go from there. And if it doesn't work, we'll revise it and go from there. There's, these are not resolutions in the sense that questions are solved forever. They're resolutions in the sense we found a way to go forward and live our lives together. That's what self-government is all about. Um, and we have to believe in that. And we have to understand that our legislatures are the way that we do that in America. If, if we just despair of our legislatures and say, well, these are a bunch of doofuses uh, who like to call each other names let's just not assume that they can do anything good for us let's just say go with the scientific experts because they seem like a a, a more capable lot um, we're really putting ourselves up a creek and um, that's unfortunately where we are today so we're, we are uh, getting down to the wire here um, uh, I'm if the panelists are okay with it. We can go a few minutes past time. We have a couple of questions that I uh, would like us to get to. Um, uh, so one viewer asks, we know the scientific method is built upon questioning, not upon blind acceptance of expertise. Similarly, trust is built upon transparency. So wouldn't the best way to increase trust and expertise be not to tout the expertise of scientific experts, but for us to increase transparency around scientific development and to emphasize the methodology of science rather than the authority and expertise of scientists. Uh, Ari, I, I'd like to, to pose that question to you. Yeah, I think I would be, be okay with that. I think that would be better than what we have. I think that's still an incomplete view uh, of what science is. I think that's still, that view still risks there being something a little bit um, inhuman and ethereal um, about the scientific process while, you know, while also in a way depicting it as more human it depicts it as something that people actually do um I, I think the most important thing is for people to be able to talk about science as having something at stake there being something that science is interested in um, and that we should be interested in it because it bears and express our expresses our interests um, discovering truth is one of those interests it's a very very important one um uh, you know although famously if you get into these sort of philosophy 
philosophical questions. Um, science itself doesn't justify why we should care about the truth. That's something that comes to us for other reasons, that that's something we should be interested in. Um, but it is also a way of, of doing things and achieving priorities that our society has decided upon. Um, we can and have talked throughout the pandemic about, for example, in a, the Israeli model for responding to the pandemic, um, Singapore's model for responding to the pandemic, uh, even Slovakia has had a, a distinctive model for responding to the pandemic. What is the American model for responding to the pandemic? That's a question I haven't really heard asked, and I don't think that there is an answer to it. Um, it is a question, that form of question is one that we've been able to ask in past eras of American history without sullying or tarnishing um, the integrity of science. It's one we were able to ask during the Apollo program, during World War II, uh, earlier than this, during the industrial era. Um, science has a, a kind of set of it's not simply subservient to the rest of society. It has a set of interests and questions of its own, but those are continuous uh, and, and they flow in, in organic ways with the, the rest of um, a society's concerns. It's why you can have different societies with different models for, um, for how you do science. So I think recognizing science as something that is part of the human world that we should listen to. We talk about it now as if we should follow it because it is somehow inhuman, because it stands outside of the messiness of human affairs. That is um, only a partial truth. And by making it the whole truth, we have really, really tarnished and degraded the things that can be very valuable about it. I think the task is to start recognizing the ways that it is actually properly human and continuous with the rest of, uh, with the rest of human affairs. And yes, I think talking about uh, it in an open way, the way that science actually happens, uh, treating people as adults and treating them as being able to uh, grapple with um, all of the kind of nitty gritty and the, um, the tangible questions of how these studies are, are carried out and the different methodological disputes. Simply treating people as being uh, able to handle that without falling to pieces, you don't just have to, to present the final conclusion to them, is a sort of show of respect for people. I think it is worth doing just for that, for that reason alone. So this is actually a, a nice segue to another question. Um, and uh, this is one I want to ask uh, of Taylor. Uh, so, uh, and I think maybe this would be a good place for us to, to conclude the discussion. Um, so one viewer asks, um, Yuval Levin recently wrote in the New Atlantis, plug for uh, Aries Journal there, about the, difficult, uh, the difficulty of acting on provisional knowledge in a polarized culture. How is a more nuanced understanding of the role of science and thinking perhaps of the kind of uh, the kind of science that you just gave, Ari, um, a more nuanced one. Uh, how is that possible in such a polarized culture? Uh, so, Taylor? Yeah, um, it, it, it'd be very difficult to realize in a, in a polarized culture. And I mean, what I what I write a lot about in my book is, is that, um, you know, we, we say a lot about it living in a post-truth era, but really it's the, that we overemphasize truth, that we want that this belief that once we know the truth, then all that's left is for politics to institute that into law. Um, and so I think a lot of it comes down to, um, even if we're polarized, because I don't necessarily think polarization is bad. I mean, um, partisanship, e even bias is, is helpful. It actually, I would say even in science or democracy, because it's really, it's a, the truth isn't doesn't happen in the mind of any individual, it happens between people, right? It's what philosophers of science would say, intersubjective. And what we need is we just need to have very critical disagreements and complaints, whether it's happening in some fancy citizen assembly or in a Congress that actually works, um, to be able to kind of come up with compromises and solutions. And it just takes, what it just takes is just takes a little bit of intellectual humility, a little bit of civility, like the, democracy doesn't have to be nice. We don't have to like each other. It doesn't have to be kumbaya. Um, but just to say, that the people that we disagree with, they have some right to realize some of what they want out of the world. And it's possible, just possible, they might be clued in on something that I don't know, right? That I don't recognize. Either something that just, I don't recognize because it's not important to me and it's important to them, or it could be some side of the of the issue that I've just never looked at. And I think it's it's just sort of, hopefully if my more optimistic days, I hope we could build to a political culture where there's just that little bit of civility and giving people their due. 
Well, I think that's a, a perfect note for us to end this conversation. I, I want to thank uh, all of you for watching uh, or listening. And I want to thank our panelists for, for joining us and sharing their insights. Uh, this has been a pleasure. And uh, I look forward to having more of these conversations uh, in the future. So thanks very much. Thank you, Tony. This was great.